chairing this event from the from St David's on the west coast rather than being with you all in Abergavenny which I know would have been a preferable thing to do but it did have the advantage for me about swimming in the sea before lunch and picking wild parasols on the coast path as a start for us. So today our topic is rapid responses for emergency times. How can a small country like Wales think and act radically differently about the future of food? And I'm, I'm really privileged to have with me today three, three experts passionate about their topics. And in a minute or two, they're gonna be answering some questions and building on ideas. And we've got with me, um, with us today, Patrick Holden, found, fa farmer and founding director of the Sustainable Food Trust, John Davis, NFU president for Wales, and Holly Tomlinson, policy coordinator for the Land Workers Alliance. And it's kind of interesting, I suppose, at the minute, you know, COVID takes up so much of the headlines and it's kind of, it's pushed Brexit off some people's agenda, but not our three panelists for sure. But at a wider level, we have this crisis of food and land. Just earlier this week, um, Lancaster University produced a report showing that 90% of the soils that they surveyed were thinning globally. And only 16% of those had lifespans of less than a century, but that's still a pretty critical position to be in. We know that the state of our biodiversity and our rivers is in really serious challenge. The report out last week in England showed that not one river was in good chemical condition. And the way we manage our land clearly has to change. And on the health side, when I talk to, talk to clinical directors and directors of innovation and health, they tell me that the diabetes map of Wales is gonna go from being red dots to being a red country as the consequences of poor diets winds its way through the health system. And we have in a crazy world, the, the gross cost of mental health which is directly connected to the quality of food we eat and the amount of time we spend in nature is around about the same as the total value, productive value of the Welsh economy. So we live in crazy times and we've got uh, 55 minutes to come up with some practical solutions on what to do. So each of my panelists today is gonna to respond to a kind of a, a kickoff question and then be joined by each of the, by, by the other two to build on those ideas and take this forward. And I'm gonna be pushing them for really specific ideas that we can take forward to businesses, to local authorities, to health boards and to ministers, as well as you as citizens to really move this forwards. And we could be doing that for about 40 minutes and the back end of that, there'll be a Q&A. So please post your ideas into the Q&A or send them through to us on the chat. And after the event, the, the whole recording will be shared on YouTube so you can push that out to people for a wider a piece. So that any further ado, so Patrick, you're a farmer, amazing cheese maker, founding director of the Sustainable Food Trust. So the question that I want to put to you is to say, what are the actions that are most vital to building a food system optimized for human well-being? And what do you think are the, what are the bits, the missing links that would allow communities, people, and nature to flourish? Patrick, the floor is yours, take it away. Well, that's that's a huge question. I can't even begin to answer that. You have five um, minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, no, I've got to say, first of all, I'm in a good mood because I'm a Pink Floyd, Floyd fan. Uh, and I'm a Londoner in 1968. I disobeyed my father and went to Middle Earth uh, to a Pink Floyd concert. So um, then after that, when I heard Pink uh, Middle Earth, I, I, I decided I'd uh, get back to the land and came to Wales. And here I am still 47 years later. And uh, your, to your question, I think that COVID has, for all its horror, uh, unearthed a latent, emergent interest in food, the story behind our food, the provenance of our food, uh, its sustainability, and more and more people, most people I would even say, if they knew what they could do, they would wish to buy food, which has a good story, and is addressing climate change and biodiversity loss and is increasing the food security of Wales. Um, but there are barriers. And I guess the barriers include the fact that at the moment, it pays better to farm in ways which, is damage, which are damaging to the planet and public health um, than it does to farm in a sustainable way as we are trying to do. And as a result of that, most farmers who haven't got a day job like me, which you referred to, um, are just farming the way they have to to stay in business and 
Many farmers have just become commodity slaves, selling their food at or below the cost of production to remote markets. And if you go into a supermarket today and you ask yourself the question, I won't, you set, you set yourself a challenge. I won't buy any food from this supermarket unless it's got a proper story that I can identify on the label. It comes from Wales, it's sustainably produced. I know the producer. Most likely in most supermarkets, even in Wales, you'll go out of, out of the shop with very little in your basket. And that has to change because I believe the biggest single change that can happen is citizens using their individual power, both as uh, consumers, but also uh, citizens and, and electors uh, to bring about the change that we all want to see. I think we need to tell politicians that they need to reward sustainable farming and they need to make farmers, uh, and I'm not blaming the farmers, but we need to do this, financially accountable uh, for the consequences of the uh, methods of farming that they're using. Because if that was the case and the subsidies were redirected, as the Welsh Government are going to do, I believe, um, then the price of sustainable food would come down and the price of unsustainable food, which is dishonestly priced at the moment, would go up. And without that happening, it's very difficult for farmers to respond to the signals. But if you're just an, a, a single person thinking about what should I do if I want to take action myself, I would say go into a shop, supermarket, wherever it is, make sure that from now on, as much as possible of the food you buy comes from Wales, your, in terms of your staples, of course, you can't have tea, coffee and bananas in Wales, but the stuff that Wales can grow, which is a huge range of different foods, uh, that you know that it's sustainably produced or at least as sustainable as possible and it's as local as possible and you know who the producer is. And if, if everybody did that, the market would be transformed. You're in no doubt, you're, you're in no doubt about that, Patrick. No doubt whatsoever, because I think there's an appetite for change sweeping through the world at the moment. We're in the last chance, Salil. We have to do these things. It's no longer an option. It's a necessity. Great. OK, well, thank you. Thanks. Great, great start point there. John, let me come to you next. Um, to this, I mean, I think you know, you're very much on the same page as Patrick in terms of trying to move things forward. But what's your kind of take on that? Well, it's great to be here this afternoon, Andy, and obviously I always normally enjoy coming to our um, Abergwenny Food Festival and having some of the fantastic offer that's available there. And that's what's really good about the Food Festival, the way it allows the consumer to connect with the producer. And if there's anything we've learned from COVID, I think it's really, really important that we do shorten these supply chains and we do have less processed food you know for me the less processing that goes in the better it's a fantastic job that I that I have you know I'm, I'm a farmer from uh, the foothills of the Epping and for any of you know the Epping is half of the community that I come from with is um, is a military range so we've seen a lot of change we've seen a lot of evolution but the roots grow deep in in uh, Merthyr Cynnig and you know I'm a, a fifth generation farmer so I'm really really keen on this sustainable angle you know because my father and his father were fantastic farmers you know but things change things evolve and we know a lot more about how we need to be more sustainable these days so I'm particularly pleased to have planted over 5,000 meters of new hedgerow I'm particularly pleased to be able to show you my bird field to be able to show you my pollinator field and things like this because you know we have to sell the story and we have to build that opportunity like i've been with you andy co-steering with some of your team and if it was merely a walk around the bay it's a fantastic site and everything else but it's the washing machine and jumping off the side and all of those things that you do to build on what you produce and what you deliver that's what we've got to do and I think if I I'm going to draw that analogy really if I was just merely producing beef or, or lamb you know we produce Welsh black beef and um, Evelyn and the Welsh black team would say of course it's the best beef in the world it's a highly sustainable Welsh blacks have uh, have traveled the hills of Wales for generations hundreds of years and uh, you know it's a really really fantastic tasting product now you know, that's what we've got to do. We've got to build that story. We've got to shorten that supply chain and we've got to get the consumer coming back and asking for more. So to do that, we've got to be able to prove because I can say that my beef is different to normal beef, but where is the proof on that? So I'm really excited about the opportunities going forward to be able to do that. And if we can get a sustainable farming index, 
a sustainable farming platform where I can prove and I can validate what I do, you know, and we're doing some carbon footprinting. I've been involved in net zero work from an INFU. We've got the commitment to be net zero by 2040. You know, that's a world leading commitment, Andy, but we have to validate that. We have to be able to prove that. So when I say Welsh is the best or British is the best, here are the facts behind it. So I think there's some really exciting opportunities. If we get this policy right, if we get this joined up, we need to be able to prove and validate. So, you know, that's what I see. I'm really keen to see a balance of consumer power with citizen power, because very often the consumer is focused on affordability, and I totally understand that where we are at the present time, but we have a citizen's responsibility as well. And, you know, that's really, really important. So we have to have a sustainable platform on we, on where we go forward. We have a clear ambition to be the most climate friendly farmers and food producers in the world. And together, I really think we can do that. And the benefits that will come from uh, doing that to our health and our wealth and our uh, country will be very, very significant. And I would say you, um, in terms of being um, what Wales can be. Wales can be a speedboat, not a super tanker. You know, we have that ability to turn and manoeuvre and adjust to the marketplace. Let's use that. Let's work together on this and let's get that right. And just, just unpack for me a little bit more and then I'll ask you as well to that, Patrick, this thing about, about shorter supply chains. What's the, what do you see as being the biggest benefit for shortening those supply chains? Because it's, I mean, people talk about food miles, but they're not the biggest culprit in terms of carbon. Where's the real value for citizens, communities and land by shortening those supply chains? So in terms of value, Andy, you know, we have a circular economy and the shorter that circle can be and the more related that can be, the better. So in terms of shortening that supply chain, you know, we deal with over 100 businesses at home here from our thing. Those are all local communities. That's really, really important to me. So if I can work within a short supply chain, I can build wealth within that area. And that's really, really important to me. Because, you know, one thing that we do forget very often is, is that community value. And, you know, you've been involved in different projects around, uh, around Wales. We just need to get those dots joined up a bit more effectively, I would say. Um, we, it's easy to talk about shortening supply chains. Let's really work with our retailers. Let's really work with the health board in Wales, for instance. Let's get more proper Welsh food onto patients' um, menus, you know. Um, uh, mum is mum and dad are 90 dad falls off things now and again and has to go to hospital this and that and uh, mum's been fortunate to have a, a heart bypass fantastic care but the food could have been better you know Andy so let's let's just work together and let's join these dots a little bit more effectively I would say and also in terms of our education things very often we look at the cost of school meals whereas we need to look at the value and what those children are getting from it. And we need to invest in young people like never before, I would suggest, Andy, with the challenge that we face in the future. Great. I know the short supply chains will be a bit that Holly, I'm sure we'll be talking about in a second, but just before coming to you, Holly, Patrick, I know you were involved in the crazy situation where your carrots were being shipped across the country. Just talk to us a little bit from your perspective of what the barriers are to getting these common sense shortening of supply chains, and then we'll move around and hear from Holly. Yeah, it's a really, I think it's a crucial point that's just made on the chat. I mean, what the reason why all these food companies, the supermarkets, um, have one packing operation or one processing point or one abattoir for most of the key commodities they sell is because it makes them more money or it saves them money. I mean, if we take my, me as a case study, I used to grow carrots. For 26 years, we grew carrots on this farm and we were selling them to the UK supermarkets and there were a couple of pack houses in Wales that we used to supply. But then the supermarkets decided that they would, uh, they would pack all their carrots in one pack house. So they progressively closed them all down, all the ones in the west of England and Wales, until there was only one pack house left, packing all the carrots were Waitrose and Sainsbury's who we were supplying. And that was 230 miles away in Peterborough. So we had to give up. And if you look at that as an example, it's true for the abattoirs, it's true for the meat packing plants, for all the vegetables. It's really depressing and it's 
They're doing it because they can and because they save money. So if we say that's not acceptable, we want local abattoirs, meatpacking plants, vegetable places. We, we are the customers. And if they don't supply, we should take our customer, else, our customer elsewhere. Now's the time to do this. And John, you and I have been talking already about having a meeting with the supermarkets because I think it's time they need to be held to account. And if you're up for that, I think we should do that prompted by this discussion. Excellent. Thank you, Patrick. So Holly, I know that, I know that this thing about local, local processing and stuff is, a, is one of the things that you're really keen on. Talk to us about the work you're doing at the moment at the, La at the Land Workers Alliance and why those, again, maybe starting with those supply chains piece about where you think the solutions can come from. Yeah, it's, it's really great that we're having this conversation about short supply chains and it's, it's a big priority of ours because um, the Land, Land Workers Alliance represents small scale, sustainable and medium family farms. Um, and I myself um, live and am the uh, admin and director of um, a cooperatively run vegetable scheme serving about 150 families in the local area in Gwyneth. Um, so yeah, we're all about short supply chains, and um, I, I'm really pleased about the uh, pa Patrick and John's idea of sitting down with the supermarkets. Um, and you know, credit to you. Um, I would also like to expand the alternative to the supermarkets. Yeah. Um, so I we've got um, a few proposals for this, um, which you know will need a lot of buy-in from various people, but if I can lay out some of them now. Um, so firstly, um, uh, looking at the role that community supported agriculture and particularly veg box schemes can play in facilitating shorter supply chains and more security for farmers. Um, because going back to the, the COVID situation, um, early in the lockdown, there were problems of for the for larger scale producers that were supplying supermarkets redirecting away from restaurants whereas actually for the smaller scale producers they may have lost the restaurant trade but were really were able to rapidly redirect into direct marketing and that showed flexibility um, and we'd like to expand that so the first proposal would be to work for communities and um, new entrant or ex and experienced veg farmers to work with livestock farmers to um, for the livestock farmers to make small bits of land say five acres available for a, um, a veg box scheme and then with that not a, once that veg scheme is established and I would say we you know aim for talking about doing this in the next 18 months uh, um, and we've only currently got around 10 in Wales I think we could have five per county um, but having a um, so you'd, you'd need to have a funding for a grower you'd obviously need to have the rent for the livestock farmer you'd need to have the marketing and um, the training and business advice for setting that process up. Once that's established, we've got a, say, a weekly veg scheme, then that's also a route for market for the livestock farmer because then that can, because that veg box can be a route in for selling meat boxes or eggs or milk and you've got you in the process of establishing the market. Um, and this example, actually, one of our members, um, Gerald Miles in Pembrokeshire, he, about 20 years ago, his farm, livestock farm was, they were suffering a lot. They brought in a CSA, a veg CSA, and it really revitalized the farm and brought in the community. And they still, now they're a mixed farm. Um, so I see multiple benefits. In terms of who would need to be in that conversation, obviously it's got to be, um, it's got to have farmers I'd like to you know I'd like the thoughts of John and Patrick as to how you know what they think the appetite for that would be um from the livestock farmers side so you, you want to get working with lo existing local community groups and work out and 
with existing veg CSAs to get that guidance. Um, the, the second proposal that I have would be a, um, a focus on public procurement and taking the sort of pre the Preston style of local wealth regeneration where Preston was had a lot of success in using key public sector anchor organizations to procure locally so why can't we do that in Wales with food so we're talking you know, hospitals as John mentioned um, schools uh, prisons even um, councils you know all public sectors that need to procure food to explicitly to um, prioritize local food grow and but include within that provisions for minimum standards for soil carbon sequestration and biodiversity because we need to tackle these issues and using public procurement to incentivize that can have a real benefit and I believe Copenhagen have done this successfully um, was, I heard something like 80% of their public procurement Copenhagen's organic someone might want to correct me on that exact figure but um, I know that they've had 90% I think it 90%. is now. great <laughs> um, so so in terms of what that would need as well as having the commitment from public bodies you'd also need to bring back some of these processing so i mean our on our veg farm we're not we wouldn't be able to produce and um process carrots in a manner that would be easy for a school or a hospital to chuck into their meals but having a you know a, a county or a couple of a couple of processing places per county where we could wash slice package vegetables and then have them in the manner that they could be dealt with would um would i think make things much easier so um i guess that again we we need to bring in people i i don't i know that we don't want to just talk about what we are asking the government to do but there are obviously well, public bodies there so that, I, i've got to build there holly so that yeah i, I did some I did some rough maths on the kind of community support agriculture idea for Wales. Uh, and if we, if we put a box of fresh organic vegetables on each and every household table in Wales once a week, we'd need six and a half thousand schemes, the size of Kaitan, like 100, feeding 120. And, I, and whether we go to six and a half thousand or a thousand or 2000, clearly there's a huge shift needed around engaging farmers, you know, John's members, in, in, in connecting their production with, with that kind of local growth and, and taking the learning that Patrick's got about the kind of the land stewardship. So John, can I just come to you and respond to that point about Holly's about, could, could you imagine a place where we get thousands more farmers either working, either renting land or doing it themselves to, to do this kind of community support agriculture schemes in effect, where the farmers are paid up front for the food they're gonna grow because people are committed to buy it. I think there'd be a lot of interest in that, Andy. You know, we bought um, some potatoes this year off a of friend of Patrick's, actually, Peter, and uh, they were organic potatoes, and um, we're just picking them now these days. You know, they're all shapes and sizes, but they taste absolutely fantastic. And, uh, you know, the pleasure I get from harvesting, you know, and seeing the yield that we're getting from just one small potato that's been planted, it's really, really immensely perishable. And um, we had a neighbor from the village that was helping us uh, pick potatoes the other day. And he said, John, we haven't done this for 30, 40 years. We always used to have, everybody used to have a row or whatever. And, you know, it was, okay, we were picking them by hand. Our uh, equipment wasn't, um, it cost me 400 quid to pick, the picker did so I hadn't broke the bank but uh, you know it was back breaking work but it was quite really enjoyable and see good for you John opportunity there. good for I you you're setting an example to all your members <laughs> it's brilliant but I think there's opportunity uh, but we have to get some structure into this Andy because you know on a wider scale what I want to be able to do is create opportunity from our members which doesn't re re you know rely on voluntary labour you know, so we've got to really get this sorted. So in terms of central um, work, in terms of packaging and processing, you're absolutely right, Holly. 
We do need some processing facilities in each county. We do need to share equipment. You know, we're not talking about massive self-propelled machinery here. You know, if we had a reasonable machine and some reasonable storage areas, you know, we could do hours in a day. So that could move around, it wouldn't be a problem. So I think there's opportunity there, Andy. There's opportunity as well to get young people involved. You know, we used to have the, the, the next holiday period that's coming used to be called potato picking week. So dad told me many years ago, <laughs> you know, what a fantastic way to get children back involved. You know, we talked many times about what's that? You, you do this speech much better than me about grow your own food, cook your own meal, live and uh, sleep under the stars one night. Come on, give us that speech, Andy. That's, I really <laughs> love that one. <laughs> I'll, do, I'll, do, I'll do that. I'll maybe do that a piece to wrap up on that. But I guess, because I get, there's, there's, a, there's a comment just coming in um, from Andy William on the chat about part, part of the challenge we've got is that the obvious thing for farmers currently to do is to pick the product and ship it to supermarkets. So you've got to rebuild almost the culture of that local supply reconnection piece from scratch. And I just, Patrick, again, building on, on Holly's point, what are your thoughts on the practicality of, of making it a normal thing to do where at least part of farmers production is really focused on that connecting to local communities, well-being, health, land, and so on? Yeah, I mean, this, um, this thing on the chat, uh, who said this? Andy William. Andy, yeah. Um, about, you know, is it, is it top down or is it bottom up? It's kind of summary, isn't it? You know, how does change happen? I think it's both. So I do think it's important for us to put pressure and shame the big food companies to do better. But I also think what Holly describes is absolutely the, the core of it. Because in the end, we need to know our farmers. We need to get, it needs to be a much more personal relationship again. Is, which is how it used to be. And we need to, get, we need to get that back. So I think we need disruptive, radical, new ways of getting food from people who grow it to people who eat it in a direct way so that those stories are really intact and the provenance of the story is known by everyone. But we also need, for as long as a lot of people shop in supermarkets, and let's be honest, it's probably 90% of the food that is eaten in Wales at the moment is purchased in supermarkets, we cannot ignore them so i think we need a kind of pincer movement and i guess people like john and me who maybe can go and see these people and they won't just shut the door in our face we we have a responsibility to do that oh, great thank you patrick and holly coming back to you for a minute so thinking of let, let's imagine that um and i have no reason to doubt this that you know that john would be able to engage his members in rent you know some of them renting land and others doing more doing more around the csa space can you imagine that it's possible to get to engage maybe to, I mean if we were to do six and a half thousand CSAs that'd be 13,000 jobs it's a huge impact on Wales but even starting smaller could you imagine that right now there might be a thousand people ready to start say 500 CSAs in the next two or three years I think oh yeah over a two or three year period if there was if that goal was set as you know that's what we want to get because I mean, there's a huge demand among our membership for for traineeships um in so at our farm we advertised traineeship and it's you know we wish we could make it better pay but it's not um but it's still massively oversubscribed because people there's a lot of people with an appetite to learn how to grow and people who want to um, who want who want to set up their own scheme what I would say though is that this can't happen without investment and so the money there does have to be money from somewhere um, I'd like to give a plug to the Loans for Enlightened Agriculture program which we at Tud and Teg have um, have been we've been going through a process because we want to expand we want more um, tools and machinery and they have a system where they will provide a, a loan um, and you're talking uh, sort of like 60,000 um, and then they'll also provide a grant of around 20% and that but with crucially with that they provide consultancy and training and in Wales, we've got some great training, like Tavi Cymru do a great job, Farm and Connect do a great job. But what we don't have is that connected to infrastructure. So you can also, you know, there's also grants for infrastructure, 
but the great thing that Leap do is you, they tie it all together, they help develop your business plan and then they provide the funds to make it happen. And so I think something like that model to assist with these being set up would make, would enable it to happen to provide the infrastructure and um, the training and the income. Great. So, and so one, one of the things that I put, I put a link to in the chat, there's a, there's a movement in the U S called slow money. And it's a way of people putting, taking a hit on the interest of a couple of percent and lending low interest, long-term finance to, pe to people investing in land. And I think what's interesting is at a Wales level, there's around about 80 billion pounds of savings and investments in Wales, 60, 60 billion in pensions and 20, 20 billion in ISAs. And all for, except five businesses, all of that is invested in businesses outside Wales. And I think the right opportunity to invest in land and farmers in projects like that, so people can put a small slice of their investments in the right frameworks and that could be an amazing thing to do, to really invest in those, in that kind of local food piece. Um, can I just come back to you as well, to each of you as well, just to pick up a, think, think about this piece around the health, the wider health benefits. How aware of you of conversations that are happening at the moment between your organization and kind of health boards, recognizing that you know, Hippocrates, with, you know, doctors sign this Hippocratic oath, who said, you know, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Yet we've got this separation of those two at the moment. Where are the, thing, where are the sort of points of light you're seeing at the moment around reconnecting food and health in a way that gives you hope? And then after that, we'll, we'll go from that and dig into some of, the, so that some of the chat questions that have been coming through. Patrick. Well, we're in a dark place, I'd say. I had a <laughs> conversation with Gordon Brown um, just when he was about to become uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer. I met him at the House of Commons at some reception. And I said to him, um, I said, if, you, if we could prove to you that if you invested in sustainable agriculture, you could save on NHS treatment costs, uh, would that be interesting? Uh, and, he, and he kind of looked at me and he said, that sounds very new labor or something like that. <laughs> and I absolutely, I mean, if you, that was a long time ago now, nothing has happened. And we have a national disease treatment service. We don't have a national health service. And if you're not sick, when you go into hospital, the food will make you sick. So I think, you know, I know Andy, you're doing stuff which is really beginning to change things, but my goodness, it's needed. We're, we're in a terrible place where all the government departments are all siloed and they don't think about the massive cost savings. Just tell you a tiny story. There's a cookery school called Ballymaloo Cookery School in the West of Ireland. And Darina Allen, a great friend of mine who runs it, she says they have these residential courses with 60 students coming in. And when they come in, 20% of them have food intolerances and allergies. And when they leave, because all the food that they eat there and they cook is grown on the farm and it's organic and everything, uh, all except the celiacs have lost their food intolerances. So I think there's a massive connection between the way food is grown and all these food intolerances, allergies, cancers, all these problems of course it's partly processing but it's also the way where we grow the food so if we can get that message across uh this would be huge great thanks patrick john thoughts on that health food connection i think there's some massive opportunities there andy but i would say that i concur with patrick around the silo working you know we are what we eat at the end of the day aren't we and um you know, human health is reflected that quite clearly at the present time. You know, I'd be against over-processing of food. I'd like to have, you know, um, a clear natural line of sight to where it's come from. And as uh, you said earlier, it's great to know where it's come from, Patrick, you know, and, um, you know, there are more opportunities there around the social uh, prescribing side of things as well, because it's an immensely pleasurable thing to work yeah. with animals, yeah. or grow your own food or whatever. So I think there's real opportunity there that we probably are not tapping effectively at the present time. On that food health connection, Holly. Yeah, I guess um, it's, as Patrick said it's a we're not in it we're in a dark place right now and um we have multiple diet related health epidemics um yeah. i guess the positive is in the po the potential um rather than <laughs> the reality <laughs> um i think you know 
most people, most adults in Wales aren't getting their five a day. Um, but um, some, some research by Amber Wheeler found that um, just 2% of the land in Wales, we could actually produce all of that here. We could produce five a day for the population, which I think is a, a great opportunity, but it's not, you know, we, there's, there's got to be some drive to make it happen. And I think, I think what's where we, you know, I think it picks up on what Patrick was saying a minute ago. One of the crazy things is that the, the social prescribing type programs that John was referring to about getting people onto the land for mental and physical well-being are nearly all funded through special project funding. So funded through like little bits of funding, mm. whereas GSK or whoever it is who makes Prozac or Ritalin, they get their funding from core budget. And so I think we need to re we need to really rethink about how health health board budgets align with the well being of food and land. And there's this kind of crazy position we're in, whereby the the well being of future generations act, you know, which, which I know all of you and many of the audience are aware of, has a requirement in it to maximise contribution towards all seven of the well being goals. And part of the problem is that no one has a clue what maximum looks like. And I think if we could if we could pick up on that conversation that, you know, Patrick and, and John and that you could be, you know, could be involved bringing health boards, supermarkets, you know, growers and others together and say, what's the most that we could do based on what's already happening in Copenhagen or elsewhere? The benefits for Wales could be enormous. Yeah, public procurement on a big, big scale. I mean, it, it should be a political issue that should determine who gets elected in Wales, whether they're prepared to make a deep commitment to all food on the public plate, as Holly was saying, being sourced sustainably and locally with, with, with all the staple foods, especially the livestock, the grass-fed meat, and all the thing, and the vegetables, and all the things that Wales can produce so well. It's an absolute scandal that that isn't happening. And it needs to be, be political, you know? And, and, and I don't know I, if there are any health people or politicians listening, tuning into this. How can we tell? Well, I guess, well, well a question for them to consider, which is which has just come in on, on the chat, is about how do we make how do we make sure that that the quality of food that we're talking about, you know, local, organic, you know, food that's good for land and people, is is available for everybody, not just the lucky few who can afford it. And and because this this the, the the equity issue around access to good food for health is a is a huge challenge as we all know we just i'd love to hear your thoughts on how do we make sure that everyone in wales regardless of where they live regardless of where they you know how much they earn or what they've learned has access to kind of quality of food that can restore their health and nature and keep farmers on the land um, patrick do you want to kick off on that first and then we'll go to holly and john well i mean it is a government issue isn't it so partly it's the absence of true cost accounting because food pricing is dishonest. You know, people think uh, we have access to cheap food. It's not really cheap at all. We're just paying for it in hidden ways. So I think the first thing we need to do is to make sure that the polluter pays, um, the subsidies are properly given, the subsidies to survive Brexit, go to farmers to incentivize them to build soil carbon and to produce um, more sustainably right across their farms. But I also think that for people for whom affordability of food is an issue, there need to be special measures taken because it should be the citizen's right. Every citizen should have access to good, healthy food. And if that takes a chunk of the, the, the budget of the government, then that's what it should take. But I mean, the first steps would be public procurement, as we've been saying. They haven't even taken those steps. Why not? I heard... Um, Somebody, I heard Zach Goldsmith in a conversation yesterday was blaming Europe for it. He was saying, oh, it's the European Union. What nonsense. I mean, France and Italy have been doing this. You know, we could do it now. So I think this has got to be politicised in this, with a small p, of course. Of course. No, no, great. Um, Holly, your thoughts about how do you make sure everyone having access to good quality food? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question because we don't want um, good quality sustainably produced food to be a sort of luxury item it's got to be it's a basic right um at the land workers alliance we're actually trialing um some work with the independent food aid network to link up um food banks with small-scale farms so to innate because 
I mean, one of the tragedies of the last decade is that the food bank model is becoming embedded. And whilst food banks might, you know, in a crisis as a short term measure, yeah, absolutely makes sense. But we don't want that to become the way that people have to get their food. Um, so, yeah, looking at alternatives where people who would otherwise be getting the whatever's at the food bank would be able to get access directly from um, from local farms. Um, I'm afraid I'm not involved in that trial, so I don't know the details, but I'd just say look out for more news where it's it's starting soon. And um, you know, once we've once we've done that, we'll be using that to make recommendations. Um, I mean, I think ultimately it's got to be that there's a bigger picture about poverty, which probably goes beyond, you know, goes into the benefit system and beyond, unfortunately, the remit of the Welsh government. Um, but yeah, absolutely, we it it needs interventions. It don't, I, it can't rely on either sort of charity or just the the benefit you can't rely on the people who are trying to make things work taking the hit it's, it's this is where you need public support and one one of the things that i, I want to come to you in a second john to talk about that there's a great, a great question here about how do we help people move towards seasonal product which has to be a key part of relocalizing those diets um, and just before we do, one of the things about that, the poverty point, Holly, that, that you raised, there's an amazing um, um, retail, retail business in Brighton that I've just put in the, in the chat called HISBE, which stands for How It Should Be. And How It Should Be is an activist supermarket who call themselves supermarket rebels. And they're, they're you know, relatively small business, like a million quid business in Brighton, but they put 11 times more benefit for every pound back into local community. I have 130 local suppliers from one store. And the, the smaller to those suppliers get paid in four days. So I think there's a really huge opportunity to not only rethink production, but rethink the relate, how we actually access our food and communities, not only through CSAs, but taking models like Hisby and go and, and, go and take 30, 40 or 100 million pounds of value off supermarkets and put it back in communities across Wales where, where that can address the poverty that was created by people losing jobs because of supermarkets. But John, coming to you about this kind of local connection bit, how do we, how do we get to this point where you know, A, everyone can access it and do away with the seasonality, which means we have to then buy from supermarkets if that's our choice? Yeah, thanks Andy. I was just glancing through some of the questions in the chat and there's some really interesting questions going on there and should the Welsh Government recognise food production as a public good? Yes, of course it should if it's in a sustainable manner. You know, under the European definition of public goods, um, food production is recognised as one. So that's the key thing for me, Andy, is making sure that sustainable food is linked and marketed correctly, you know, and that doesn't mean it has to be organic, you know, we're not organic at home, many other farms throughout Wales aren't organic, but you know, we don't waste one grain of fertiliser, you know, we do nutrient management plans, we look where the nutrients are needed and we only apply as and when they are needed and it's absolutely vital that we get more of that going forward. That can be part of the sustainable farming index going forward, you know, nutrient management planning, herd health planning, the likes, and the rest, you know, we need to cut down the use of AMRs, you know, we've got a fantastic story to tell on the work that's been done with antibiotics across the UK in terms of the low use there, you know, so it all goes to build that picture and absolutely agree, you know, we can't be in this privileged bubble where we're talking about these things happening and it's just for the people that can afford it. That's completely wrong. And that's where support of the public purse needs to come in. And that the two, you know, we talking about silos earlier in Welsh government, you know, we've got to mesh the food department together with the agriculture department in Welsh government. We've got to get sustainable brand values, clear, transparent and be able to prove the benefit there and that'll give us a real multiplier then in the marketplace because I strongly believe that's what the, the people want from a consumer approach and a citizen approach. 
Well, and I, and I would add to that, John. I mean, I think we need to find a new space where not only is the food department, but also Vaughan Gethings health teams need to be in that same space. But there's, Simon Wright and Patrick have raised a question about education and the kind of how, how food is so absent from this. Um, and you know, one of my daughters at school, you know, where, you know, being told didn't have time to make a sauce from scratch. So you had to use a bottle of tomato sauce to make products. And, and I've, I've had some amazing conversations with one of Patrick's colleagues, Richard Dunn, about the idea of shaping a, a food, some food literacy programs for schools in Wales. And we worked out that you could take using Zoom, you could, you could give a 10 hour program to every 10 to 14 year old in Wales for like two million pounds a year to build food literacy at a national scale about the relationship between seed, land, you know, what happens in your stomach and what happens in your, body, in your mind and your body as a consequence. So I just want to give you a magic wand for a brief moment and it'll, it'll be taken away at the end of this workshop. But uh, with a magic wand for each of you, what are the kind of elements of food education that you think you would see as being inalienable rights for every child in Wales? John, as you're on screen, picking off of you, magic wand, what would you want every child to know about food? I'd want them to see how it's produced, where it comes from, and, uh, you know, the love that goes into that. Um, there's been a fantastic project done, um, called Cows on Tour, and that means taking farm animals into schools and, and vegetable products into schools. The amount of engagement that we get with young people from that is absolutely fantastic. It doesn't happen just in Wales. We've taken it to Inner London as well, the team up. Abbey Reader is a key player in it, and there are many others that come together, they're really proud to tell their story. So we've got to reconnect. That's my magic wand, Andy. The, the wand has been broken. Let's put it back together and let's join both ends. And, and just on that, John, we talked a little while back about the idea of approaching your members to see, you know, to see if we could get members to, to make an acre of land available to every school in Wales. Is that the kind of thing that would you think might help do that? So an acre of land where they can grow and explore and see that connection between land and food and health? There was a lot of interest in that, Andy, you know, and I think we could get quite a lot of offer around that, you know, Great. and uh, it would be really nice to see that happen, wouldn't it? That'd you be know. fantastic. How many schools do we have in Wales? Was it 600? It's about, it's about, about just, it's under 2,000. Yeah, I thought so. Was it 600 junior schools? Or something? Anyway. So, anyway, we'll find out. Yeah. And pa Patrick, wish list for education for every child in Wales. Well, uh, Richard Dunn, who just got a mention uh, by you, um, he basically he's a was a head teacher uh, in a primary school, and he uh, Ofsted outstanding and all that kind of thing, and he realised that the education system that um, he was leading in his school wasn't preparing the next generation to make sense of the world that they find themselves in, or to make it a better place. And I think that is comprehensively true right through the primary and secondary education system and right through the universities. Our education system is useless. I'm talking now from the experience of my own children, you know, who are at various stages, A-levels, GCSEs, et cetera. And all it does really is to get children to repeat back facts which they learn in the exams, which are not really related to real life. And when you think about what we've got to do, to change things and so much of it is connected to farming and food in terms of the environment and everything else almost nothing in the curriculum is related to that so we do need a root and branch reform but rather like public procurement there's a lot we can do now so i think this campaign which hopefully andy you're going to lead after all this to you know make sure that we have a complete food transition in wales and we're way ahead of the rest of the, the other parts of the united kingdom it needs to have a big educational component Great. Holly, magic wand, schools and f food. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd like to go with both the um, proposal that every, every school has a small area for, um, for growing, but, and also that every school would visit farms as well, for, yeah. to large farms. I remember one of my favourite days at school was about age 10, where we visited a farm and how excited we were to shift about 10 tons of manure that was the <laughs> exciting part of the day um and actually my um my brother-in-law in bethesda has recently um in, the, in you know in the space of about six months got in touch with local primary schools to set up um growing program and found land from from local landowners to make, make and it's just small amounts available but it's um it's about to start this term and i think 
something like that for for every school would be wonderful. So and I, I don't know. And thank you, Holly. So I don't know, John, if you saw that note in the in the in the um, in the chat there. So there's about one thousand six hundred schools in Wales. So there'd be less than one in ten farms to give an acre of land to schools. I think we can make that an objective for ourselves for this year. I think we can speak to Kirsty about that, Andy. You talk about talking to different ones. Kirsty's from a farm in the in the Brecon Beacons. I think we could do some work there. I don't know how do we get the funding for the transport and stuff. Very often when we've talked about it, that's the blockage, you know, and then the health and safety. But you know, look, I think we could find significant farmer involvement around that. And uh, as as a friend said, if you could build that into the the new sustainable farming index, you know, if you're prepared to host some school visits, whether it be just on a visit just to talk about, or even better, to have a, a hands-on involvement. That's great. One of the things I really love is we have um, some local colleges come to us with their, um, oh gosh, I can't remember, is it year 12 and 13? Anyway, it's fourth and third, fourth and fifth years for um, an agricultural um, GCSE. And it's really, really fulfilling. We have about, we started off, there were six interested, and now there were, last year, there were 18 in the class. So they come for their practical involvement uh, to us for um, one term. And uh, it's really, really enjoyable. And it's really, really fulfilling having young people who are interested in asking questions from all backgrounds uh, on farm and, and taking part. And we had a, a, a young girl from a, a housing estate in Hay. And it, um, I have to be careful what I say, but it wasn't the most prosperous area, shall we say. And she was absolutely fantastic. She was in the middle, marking lambs, this, that, and the other. And uh, it was great to have, you know, real enthusiasm there. Next time you see Kirsty, John, to tell her from me, the education system as it is, is crap. It's rubbish. It's what? useless, actually. It's, tra it's training children to just re repeat stuff at exams for no useful purpose. What? And you know, I mean, this is, I'm talking about all the schools, including the independent schools and the state schools. The whole system is just moribund and it needs to be transformed root and branch. And if she can't do that, at least we can go around the edges and start to make some progress. I hope she knows that in her heart of hearts because it's just a rat race to get A stars and A's and try to you know, get up the sort of meritocracy what point is there in it? So to to move to move from to move from sorry oh, so, no no, so, the, no, 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 no a good a good rant and the new curriculum that you know that Kirsty's helped steer in I think is a really good opportunity to put problem solving around food into that. On the topic of problem solving, just as we got a couple of minutes to go, just from each of you, what's the um a great you know great a great question has come in in, in the in the chat here about saying what what is the single biggest hurdle that you you want you think needs to be overcome to deliver the kind of future that you want for food in wales so the single biggest hurdle from each of you just to close in these last couple of minutes that we've got patrick as you're on the screen go for it you can have education I, if you want but i just think people we individuals we as individual human beings and citizens we're the powerful ones we're the cells in the food system the food system's an organism it's sick we're the cells, if we restore ourselves to health and we work together, there's nothing we can't do. So I think we should feel very optimistic right now. And I think it starts with making sure that the story behind the food we eat is a Welsh, sustainable, local, you know, known to us story. And if we all did that, that's the change that's needed. Great, thank you, Patrick. Holly, over to you next. Can I have three? Go on then, if you, yeah, go for it. you can have four if you, as long as you're quick. Okay, so it would be short supply chain infrastructure. Um, so the processing, as I spoke about. So like physical places to process food. Physical places to process yeah, yeah. And, and routes to market. Yeah. Um, investment and planning, and particularly planning for farms that are less than five, five hectares but you don't have the permitted development rights yep. but also for housing on farms great perfect holly thank you very much john take us home no pressure andy well first of all it has to start with the next generation so that means investing in education making people know the value the true value of food and the 
pricing and costs don't get offshored. That's absolutely vital. Um, transparency going forward, you know, in the supply chain, that's absolutely key to it. And we have to have some clear labeling for that and effective routes to market as both Patrick and Holly have talked about earlier. You know, how do we reconnect that? How do we break that back down? You know, it's like a, 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 a salt cellar very near and you have a massive number of uh, consumers and we have a massive number of producers, but that middle part there is really um, choking the flow of what's wanted and what's needed and getting through. So, you know, there's, there's some fantastic opportunities. Let's turn Brexit into that opportunity. You know, there's been a lot of talking about taking back control. Let's really take back control here and let's use this as an opportunity to shape and drive Welsh agriculture and Welsh food production and the health of the Welsh nation effectively going forward. Thank you so much, John. So my take is that, you know, of, from these messages around you know, really properly locking local procurement in to take away tokenism, but to optimize that relationship between food, land and well-being in terms of procurement, how do we do that? I think you're, you know, Holly's point about the right kind of physical infrastructure that's, and funding to allow people, whether that's renting land or doing, you know, buying land or people's own land to get that small scale production of super fresh products growing in the, in the best way there. And f for me, that the education that we've talked about in school needs not just to be for children, but we need to make sure that every elected member in every, in every local authority understands the relationship between food and long term health as far as the land, biodiversity and everything else. And for anyone who's listening who hasn't been thinking about, who's not aware of this idea about true cost or externalities, an externality is the price of food that's not currently paid and is picked up by future generations. There's amazing work being done by people like Roman Kazanich called The Good Ancestor. Really think about what this means for the generations of our children's children about what legacy that we're leaving them. But today I'm, I'm really enthused by the opportunity to get retailers health and growers together for a radically different conversation. And I, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for your honest and enthusiastic responses today. And go and have a well-earned cup of tea. Diolch yes.